I have 10 p or 10 a.m. in the east. Oh, I've got 958 on my laptop. All right, well, then we'll give it a couple of minutes. Oh, 959. All right, 60 okay. seconds. Well, we do have 50 people registered for this uh, this class today. So that's uh, we, we want to make sure everybody gets a, um, gets a chance to hop in here. Very good. We'll so do you have a time on your laptop? Does your laptop say 10 o'clock? Yeah, in the bottom right here. Yeah, mine says 9.59. How could they be off? I would assume. Um, uh, yeah, they're not in sync, I don't think, on a universe clock. You can pick and choose where uh, you get your time source. That's obviously, we we are not on the same time. We are, uh, we are not. <laughs> well, I muted my phone so that uh, we won't be the... Uh, disturbed by my ringing I know, phone. All the, all the people calling for uh, to buy equipment off you. and <laughs> uh, They'll just have to uh, just have to wait. They'll just have to wait. I will call them back. Leave your name and number and I will call you back. Jimmy, aren't you on Amish time? Yes, yes. Uh, the cows are milked and um, and they're out in the pasture right now. Not much to eat. It's all frozen. All, yeah. All dead and frozen. All right. Um, well, I guess we'll go ahead and get rolling here. Um, welcome, everybody, to the um, second session, actually, we would say, uh, but this first for you guys for our overview on locating uh, basics, uh, basic locate theory overview class. Uh, my name is Jim Flint. I am the upstate New York representative. Uh, we have also who going to be teaching this class, Jimmy Verga. Uh, he's out of our uh, Pennsylvania, handles um, yeah, Pennsylvania. Uh, DC, Maryland, uh, Delaware area as well for Eastcom Associates. Um, uh, and this is the uh, second class we've done for our series of educational sessions for stakeholders in underground damage prevention here in the Northeast. Um, so we, we really appreciate everybody taking time out this morning to join us for this. Uh, and hopefully this will be very informative for you and answer any questions you may have on locating basics. Uh, this presentation is uh, an abbreviated version of a larger presentation that we provide uh, that is um, we're actually going to be doing virtually in February. So be on the lookout if you're interested in, in a more in-depth presentation on locate theory. Uh, that'll be broken up into three sessions over um, three different days. Uh, but those invites will be going out soon. Um, so if you're looking for those, uh, just let us know. This is in addition to a lot of other presentations that we do on underground utility uh, locating solutions. Uh, and you are all on those mailing lists for those class. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping here today. Uh, if you can, please, you do come into the meeting muted. Uh, if you could stay muted uh, for the courtesy of the other attendees. Uh, if you do have a question, you got two options. One, you can ask in the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can just type in a question during the chat and what we'll do, I'll be monitoring that and we can ask that question throughout the presentation or uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, that option is at the bottom and for some it is actually in the chat bottom of the chat portion itself you'll see a button there that says raise your hand or i've been told it's also in the reactions tab if you've updated a or uh uploaded an update to zoom uh so and check those two spots where it says raise your hand and if you do see the raise your hand function i'll be monitoring again and i'll see that i will then call on you uh, and then you can unmute yourself and ask the question as we go throughout. So uh, again, please leave yourself muted there for the courtesy of the others during this. Um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Jimmy Verga. Jimmer, before you do, can we ask Larry, Todd, and Doug to um, cut their audio, uh, their um, video? Uh, we can. Since you're recording... Hi. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah we're yeah. just recording for the, yeah. The, Ron, also, if you if can, want um, to, if you want to just mute uh, your video. Yeah. Just turn off camera if you want to do that. Larry and Todd also. They may not be in the room or. I mean, we'll go. Ahead. Oh, I can, I can do that too. Who, who else was on there? 
Uh, I see Larry, Todd, and Ron. Let me double check. I don't. Jim, when you say Larry, do you mean me? Larry? Yes, Burton? Larry. Uh, Your no, video I is. See, I don't see Larry. I don't yeah. see anybody else but you and me, Jimmy. I have my video. Uh, okay. Off. I think Very we're good, good to then. go. Very good. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jimmer, thanks for um, uh, hosting this and putting this together. My name is Jim Verga, and I've been with uh, Eastcom Associates now for 22 years, uh, servicing uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland. And uh, we're going to talk this morning about the science uh, behind how our locators work. So let's go through some, uh, some slides here uh, for this presentation. Uh, there, that's uh, our attempt at humor. Why are we locating? And of course, um, uh, there's a number of reasons uh, for locating our infrastructure. And uh, the one that Miss Utility and PA1 call like to say is that it's the law. And so um, besides all the things that we concern ourselves with, uh, with uh, maintaining the infrastructure and protecting uh, the, um, the population and keeping the uh, energy and water flowing, um, it's the law. Now, locating has been around for a long time. Uh, here's a slide going back uh, uh, over 100 years. Uh, there's a copper wire wrapped around that wooden frame, and you can see an earpiece in this fellow's ear as he's listening for signal. This is an early uh, metal detector. Here's a metal detector a few years later. Uh, it's uh, significantly shrunk in size, and we have a, uh, a receiver and a uh, antenna for picking up uh, the change of magnetic field. Now, today's locators are a lot different than they were uh, 40, 50 years ago. And uh, think about uh, the reasons for that. Um, these antennas, these uh, signals that we're looking for, we have multiple frequencies, uh, all sorts of um, additional things that our locators can do and information that our locators can give us that they didn't do uh, 40 years ago. And so what drove these advances were, we are a lot more congested underground than we were 10, 20, 30 years ago. And so all this congestion of underground utilities drives us to making our locators uh, more apt to help us locate those facilities. Now, the science we're using in um, locating utilities is the electromagnetic field science. And we have uh, a number of tools in our toolbox that use electromagnetic field technology. Pipe and cable locators, metal detectors, ferrous metal detectors, magnetic uh, uh, marker ball locators, and ground penetrating radar all use EM or electromagnetic field uh, technology. So our presentation here is gonna concentrate on pipe and cable locators. Now, something important to remember is that your locator, whatever brand you're using, your locator doesn't see pipes or cables. Your locator sees the magnetic field that we generate on that pipe or cable. And or a magnetic field that's already being carried on that pipe or cable. So the magnetic field, think of it as this uh, signal radiating off of the structure. Another way to in envision this is uh, ripples coming from a, a pebble or a stone dropped in a pond. And these ripples, as they move outward, propagate outward. That's kind of what a magnetic field is doing off of that pipe or cable. So let's go back. Magnetic fields have been around for a long time. And now in the early 1800s, we learned how we can generate a magnetic field by putting current onto that Piper cable. And that creates a magnetic field. So let's move ahead. Why does it matter that your locator sees magnetic fields instead of the pipe and cable? It's because magnetic fields do things that pipes and cables don't do. So they get distortion. Magnetic fields get distorted. In this slide, 
how many pebbles do you see dropped in that pond? If you look, your brain can tell pretty quick that it looks like three pebbles to me. Do all of you see that? So that's distortion. We have a signal on one of those structures and that signal is bleeding off onto another structure or some of our signal is carried on that other structure. And all these things create distortion of the magnetic field. So what creates the magnetic field? Us putting electrical current onto that Piper cable or current already carried on that Piper cable. What creates distortion? What affects distortion? How we're putting a signal on it? Where and what we're grounded to? What antennas are we using with the receiver, peak, null, or such? What kind of underground congestion is there with those other utilities? And what frequency and how much power are we driving into that utility with our transmitter? So think of these two utilities carrying magnetic fields physically close together. These magnetic fields can blend and distort with one another. Your signal from your utility getting onto another structure creates that distortion as well. So distortion is created by multiple utilities in the ground. Here you see a little bit of congestion in this ditch with tracer wire and other cables crossing it. Distortion is created by other utilities that we see here. Could be other metals in the ground. Your Piper cable coming near a uh, guardrail, chain link fence, could be a um, culvert pipe, manhole cover, valve casing, maybe a 55 gallon drum that got buried in that farmer's field 50 years ago. As your Piper cable is going near that drum and your magnetic field is being carried on that Piper cable, as it gets near that metal, it gets pulled or drawn towards it. That's distortion of the magnetic field on your utility. So here's a little bit of distortion. This is a lot of distortion. And a lot of us are dealing with this now in our utilities uh, networks, in our cities and towns. We have a lot of underground infrastructure. And that metallic infrastructure is going to create distortion of magnetic fields. So. We have developed years ago a process, what we call the six step process of locating. And uh, these are the steps that we use and that we teach. So let's run through them as we tie them to uh, uh, electromagnetic field locating. So the first thing that we do from a locating standpoint when you arrive on a job site is to read the street, to look for what's out there and what utilities may be buried. So whether you're a contractor wanting to know what may be in the ground that you might find with your backhoe, or you are a locator who's picking out one utility to locate while, while dealing with others underground. So we read the street, we look for the visible clues, we use our maps and our drawings, and we use our past experience to help us understand what may be in the ground here. So we've got lots of visual clues out there that we use when reading the street. Now, another clue, another thing that we could use is what's called passive locating. Now, all locators use a common, uh, not all, I should say locators use a combination of passive and active. Some locators don't have passive capabilities and uh, some have both. So let's talk about passive locating. Passive means looking for signals that are already there. And so if your locator has a position on it that shows a lightning bolt or the word power or 60 hertz, your locator is looking for a 60 hertz frequency. So we call it power. So all the substations out here and electrical plants, generation plants are creating current and voltage and current creates a 60 Hertz frequency. And that frequency can be picked up if your locator has this passive mode. Again, it'll say 60 Hertz or say the word power or show a lightning bolt. So power is picking up 60 Hertz. 
So we would think that electric cables underground will carry power. Well, that secondary service feeding a house, if the meter is not moving on the house, that is, there is no current being drawn into that house, nothing is turned on, there will not be a 60 hertz frequency on that cable. There are other cables and items in the ground that carry 60 hertz besides electric cables. Amplified cable T, uh, TV gives off a 60 hertz frequency. Telephone cables give off a 60 hertz frequency. Cathodically protected gas pipelines that use a rectifier to protect them from corrosion. That rectifier, even though it's DC, if they're unfiltered, they give off a 120 hertz AC signal. That 120 hertz is a harmonic of 60 hertz, and you'll pick it up in the power mode. Another item common in the ground that will carry 60 hertz is a water service. If your water service is the ground for the electric system in that house or building, that copper or galvanized pipe is going to carry 60 hertz out to the water main. So there's a lot of things underground that carry 60 hertz other than electric cables. So that's some background on power. Another passive mode is called radio. All the radio towers out here create a low RF frequency or signal in the atmosphere that couples onto metallic structures. So these low frequencies jump on overhead cable, telephone, and electric wires. They jump on fire hydrants and gas valves. They couple to chain link fences and guardrails. Steel frame buildings will often carry radio frequencies. So the point here is that radio, if your locator has this passive mode, it'll say the word radio or show a radio tower or the letters RF. These are the common ways that the locate equipment manufacturers will designate radio passive locating capability. So if your locator has this, you can walk out into that right away, walk across the street, setting your locator to the radio mode and pick up metallic utilities. Now, with both power and radio, it's important to remember that they don't really tell us what we found. Did we find the electric secondary, the electric primary, the cable TV wire? Did we find a telephone cable, the water service, the gas pipeline? All we know is there's something here. The power and the radio modes then are mostly used as safety sweep modes, avoidance modes. They're ways to sweep an area before excavation to tell if there's something in the ground that did not get marked out. So these modes are very popular with contractors to sweep an area before excavation or with utility companies who are being safe when they're installing uh, electric or foam poles or digging to do repairs on a water main break, let's say. So power and radio can save us from hitting things that we did not know were there. So safety sweep tools. Now, in the passive mode, it's a fast, easy way to walk across and see if we pick up signals, but we can't be sure of what it is. So the main use again is safety sweeping or avoidance. Uh, when you use the passive modes as a safety sweep tool, we want to do a grid back and forth, uh, north, south, east, west, uh, gridding to make sure we don't miss anything. And if you are trying to use it as a locate tool, track it and see where it takes you. So where is its termination point? If it leads me to the site light pole, well, that's a pretty good indicator you've been following a site light wire. So track it to a known endpoint will help you in making a determination that yes, this was a telephone cable or it was a water service. Now let's talk about active locating. With active locating, we're using our transmitter we are controlling that signal. Passive locating, we're at the mercy of the signal being carried on the utility and that utility being metallic. With active locating, we're going to control that signal. So with active locating, it gives us more information and we're gonna use that information to help us make determinations of what color we're gonna paint on the ground here. 
So this comes back now to our six step process. We've read the street and now we're gonna move ahead and we're gonna determine what is the best method to apply a signal using active locating, that is using our transmitter. So we have three ways to put a signal on a utility. We use the direct connect method where we use our red and black leads and put a signal on the utility and put out our ground spike connecting our black lead to the ground spike and the red lead to the utility. We have an induction clamp and with the induction clamp, we can clamp around that utility, around a conduit carrying wires and cables. And we have the induction method where we take our transmitter, we set it on the ground using the built-in antenna in the transmitter to induce, induce signal through the earth and have it couple onto that Piper cable. D direct connect, we call conductive, inductive clamp and inductive antenna. So of these three methods, usually the best is to make a direct connection onto the utility, conductive. Now, when we use direct connection, conductive, we have three items, basically. We have our transmitter, we have our conductor, the utility, and now the earth is the return path of signal from our utility to our ground spike, completing the circuit. Now, those of you experienced locators may have noticed that we get better signals in the spring than we do in the late summer. And the reason is moisture. The more moisture in the soil, the better that return path of signal. Back to our ground spike. Hi, Mark. It sounds like your uh, audio is on, I believe. So in this slide, we talk about the return path being the back door that the outgoing signal returns to. So let's go down to that bottom segment. Every milliamp of signal that goes out the metal to metal connection on the red lead has to come back through a metal to dirt connection on the ground lead. All right, what does that mean? How much signal goes out on your conductor is dictated by how much comes back through the earth to your ground spike. And that's why we spend a lot of time talking about grounding and getting a good ground because those things will improve our signals. So with the direct connection method, we can use a lower frequency. We can drive more power into that utility. Because we're uh, using a lower frequency and we can control that power, it gives us more information that we could be more certain of this is the identity of the utility. That is, this is my cable TV wire, or this is my electric secondary. It also gives us a little bit more information. So that would be current measurement and depth. We can use that information to make those determinations as to, is this the utility I'm connected to? We can also, by direct connect, cut down on that power, cut down on that frequency, and that limits the amount of distortion and bleed off that occurs. So with the direct connect method, some of the mistakes we make is we have our ground spike too close to our conductor. And what this does is as we send signal out on our Piper cable, it's returning through the earth to the ground spike. With the ground spike right in line or very close to the conductor, I may not get as much signal traveling out. I lose some distance on the locate. In this slide, I put the, the ground spike over another utility. So the signal goes out on my utility, returns through the earth to the ground spike. On its way, it may couple to that other utility. When it does, now I'm going to pick up two signals with my receiver. So I'm out here with my receiver picking up two signals. And now I'm trying to make a determination which one is mine. So what's one of the ways to minimize that? where you put the ground spike. Avoid putting it over another utility. So in this slide, I moved it to the other side and I minimize the amount of signal that I've coupled onto that other utility. So that means when you're connecting and putting out your ground spike, pay attention to whether, where other utilities might be running and try to avoid crossing over them. Now, in theory, the further you move that ground spike, away from your conductor at a right angle, 
the more distance you'll get on a locate. And that can help us when we're doing long distance locates such as long distance fiber runs uh, or um, uh, large diameter gas transmission pipeline runs and right of ways where we are trying to get two and three miles of distance. Move that ground spike further away and get a larger ground. So instead of the small ground spikes that come with your equipment, get a longer ground rod that you can drive into the earth deeper, reaching more moisture. Now, moisture brings up a good point because in the dry times of year, when we don't get as good a signal, we can use moisture to improve our ground. Whether you're using a small ground spike or a large a probe or ground rod, use water to improve that signal. If you don't have water, you can use coffee, orange juice, soda. You can use any liquid that may be available to you at the time to soak the soil where your ground spike goes. Should you choose to use recycled liquids at the ground rod, I recommend you turn the transmitter off before application of said recycled liquids to the ground rod. Also, someone will have to remove that ground rod from the earth after you have applied recycled liquids to it. So those are things that may work in theory, but may not be the best for practical application. Now, using an existing ground, like a guardrail, chain link fence, awkward in guy wire, stop sign, street sign, those things can all provide good grounds. If you're gonna use that chain link fence or guardrail, it needs to be far enough away from your utility. If they're too close together, say within 10 feet or so, that multiple point ground rod, that guardrail, that chain link fence is going to interfere with your signal. Your receiver will be pulled towards that. And the reason is whatever you're grounded to is also going to carry signal. So I'll give you an example. You have a uh, ground wire coming down a electric pole or a telephone pole. That nice copper ground wire grounded to the earth really well. You can ground to that. When you do, you're going to put a signal on all those utilities that are connected to that ground wire, cable, telephone, electric. If those utilities are staying overhead where you're trying to locate, say, on a gas service, a gas main, a water main, well, you're okay. If those utilities are coming underground, those signals on those utilities are going to interfere with you. So we avoid grounding to other utilities. So ground to a independent ground rod when you can. Move it at a right angle to your suspected path. And um, don't worry about stretching it way out unless you're trying to get extra long distances out of your locate. In this application, we've done something kind of unique. If you can see the cursor on the screen, we've connected to the utility and we've grounded in the direction that we need to locate. So here we have a application where we have a valve, pipe going through the valve. I need to locate in this direction. So move the ground spike in this direction, maybe at a 45 degree angle, maybe not quite as tight to the utility as we show it in this slide. But by moving it in that direction, sometimes you could encourage your signal to go that way. This slide, is using or showing the use of an extension spool. A lot of the equipment you get may have a spool of wire that came with it that you could use to reach a grounding point that's further away. A good application would be in a spot where you've got nothing but asphalt and concrete here where you've connected. But about 40 feet over there to the side, you've got a grass island, uh, but your red and black leaves are too short to reach. So use that extension wire to extend your leads. You could extend either side. Gosh, you could leave the transmitter sitting in the cab of the truck, run the wires out the window, run a jumper wire over to that fire hydrant over there and run the other grounding wire out the other window and ground to that, uh, that guardrail way over there. So you're not limited to the lengths of the red and black leads that came with your equipment. You could extend either side or both sides. And that's what this slide is talking about. 
Jimmy, uh, we do have a question in the chat um, yes. from Jim Crowley. If the soil is mo moistened only around the ground rod, how does it effectively help if the surrounding ground is all still dry? Yes, from what I understand, Jim, it just makes it more attractive. For some reason, the signal uh, still gets a benefit. And you can see that on your transmitters. Many of our transmitters show us the amount of milliamp output. And it really is remarkable. If you soak the soil and watch the milliamp output, you will see it increase on your transmitter screen. So even though the soil is dry in between, it seems to make that ground rod a little bit more attractive. That's a good question. I see it work in the field all the time. And that's my best explanation of to why it may, may benefit, but it does help. All right, let's continue along here. Oh, in this slide, uh, we're talking about using another utility as a ground. And when you do, you're gonna have signal on it and that can confuse your locate. So use that independent ground rod. We talked about the fences and fences work, guardrails work, unless they're too close to us, then you are going to get interference from it with your receiver. Now, here's something that we haven't talked about yet, a double-ended connection. I just spoke to a customer yesterday who has a, a difficult locate, and uh, this technique worked for him. We take our red lead and connect it to uh, our conductor. We take our uh, black lead and connect it to, in this case, we just connected to this valve. So these have to be pretty close together. And we can do this and isolate signal between them. In the real world, rarely will we have an application where they're so close together that our red and black leads can touch. So use that long spool of wire to extend this lead so that you could reach that far away. So an example would be two fire hydrants 500 feet apart. Connect your red lead to the one hydrant Take your black lead, connect it to that long spool of wire, run it all the way down and vice grip it to that other fire hydrant. And now you've got a double-ended connection. When you do, your signal won't go past the connection to this side. It won't go this way. It will loop between those red and black leads. And this is a way to isolate a section of pipe and also to keep your signal on this instead of bleeding off onto something else. So this could help in congested areas or in areas where you're getting bleed off onto another utility. And that was the application that that customer had yesterday. He was getting bleed off onto multiple structures. By doing this, using a lower frequency and cutting his power down, it kept that signal on his structure in between the red and black leads. Okay, so we've been talking about direct connection. Now let's talk about the inductive clamp. So clamps are used in the wire industries, cable, telephone, and electric. We can clamp around a conduit and it will induce current through that conduit onto the, uh, into the wires inside. And it's a simple, fast way for us to do uh, locate using an induction clamp. But clamps are tricky. And here's why they're generating current inside of itself, generating that current into that pipe or cable. So the clamp has to go around and it gives us our best signal when we clamp fully around the utility. But here's the trick. Clamps require grounds on both ends of whatever it is you clamped around. So we see in this slide a ground here and a ground here. So this say is a handhold and we have cable in the earth this way, cable in the earth this way grounded on each end, the clamp works. Let me give you examples of where the clamp will fail. At my house, I have a three quarter inch copper water surface coming through my block wall. Comes in a few inches and converts into PEX, plastic inside the house. If I put the induction clamp around that copper coming through that block wall, it doesn't put a signal on it. It's grounded on the field side going out to the water main copper going in the earth, but on the house side, I've got plastic. There's no ground on that side of the induction clamp. It doesn't work. 
Another example, maybe at your shop, you've got a frost-free hydrant sticking up out of the ground. Sticks up on a four foot pipe, a one inch or three quarter inch galvanized pipe with that nice red or orange hydrant top on it for washing out trucks. Well, put that ring clamp, that induction clamp around it. It's not gonna work. Pipe going into the earth is grounded, but the pipe at the top, the hydrant, is not touching earth. If you ran a ground wire from that top of that hydrant and grounded it to earth, you'd have grounds on both ends of the induction clamp. The induction clamp would induce current into that pipe or cable. Now, if you're gonna go through all that trouble, just direct connect to the pipe. You have the hydrant bib right there, just connect to it and put it out a ground spike instead of trying to use an induction clamp there. But the point is induction clamps will fail if we don't have grounds on each end of whatever it is we've clamped around. So this is another example here. We have a bonding strap, a ground strap here. The clamp works. Lift this bond and the clamp will not put signal onto these wires that are not grounded on both sides. Now, let's talk about the induction antenna. Many of us induce by dropping the box, inducing by setting the transmitter on the ground. So now, when you induce, you don't have to make a direct connection onto the pipe. We will have to use a higher frequency in many cases to induce into that pipe. The closer the transmitter is to the pipe, physically, antenna closer to the pipe, the better the signal, the stronger the signal will be. The antenna in that transmitter is directional. So from your manufacturer, you wanna know which way to put the, uh, the transmitter when you're inducing. Uh, with this manufacturer, the handle goes in line because the antenna is crossed internally. With some, they go the other way. All depends on where the antenna is placed in the housing of the transmitter. Now, the biggest problem we have with induction is that it's gonna cast a broad signal about six to 10 feet deep and about six to 10 feet across. That large signal going into the ground can send signal into multiple utilities, not just the one you're right on top of. Another problem with induction is that signal is called a dipole signal. It's got two lobes. There's a lobe of signal coming down out of the antenna going into the earth, and there's a signal coming up into the air from that antenna. The signal going up into the air is much larger because there's less resistance driving the signal into the air than into the ground. So the signal driving down is about six to 10 feet across based on soil moisture, soil resistivity. The signal going up into the air is about 30 feet up and 30 feet across. So one of the issues we have with induction is if we're standing too close to the transmitter, we air couple. So air couple means I've got to create enough distance between me and that transmitter. So if I'm standing too close to it, my receiver is going to see the signal in the air and not the signal on the utility underground. That's air coupling. So you've got to give yourself about 30 or 40 feet away from that transmitter. Now, simple test. Am I far enough away? Take your locating receiver and point it to the transmitter. If your signal gets stronger when you do this, you are too close to that transmitter. You are air coupled. If your signal drops when you do this, you probably are picking up a utility underground and not the air coupled signal through the air. Now this air coupled signal, even though you may be picking it up stronger underground, still may affect your depth readings. So when we induce, depth readings will be thrown off when we're too close to that transmitter. Even uh, 40, 50 feet away can be too close for your depth readings to have any kind of uh, dependability to them. So when you induce, there's a number of factors involved that will um, uh, make us be more cautious when it comes to putting paint on the ground to locating. All right, now we talked about multiple signals, multiple utilities, within that six to 10 foot sphere. And so usually the signal is strongest coming out of the center of that antenna. So the stronger signal can be on this utility. But if these utilities are better conductors, that is 
This center is a cast iron pipe, and I've got cable TV on this side and telephone on this side. Well, the telephone and cable are better conductors than that cast iron pipe, and they will carry better signals than the pipe directly underneath the transmitter. All right. Now, of us, we have applications where we are forced to induce, and I've got another utility in my way. So here's a trick that we could use with most of our transmitters. We can take that transmitter and turn it on its side. Do you remember I was saying that the signal is a dipole signal It comes out of the antenna downward and upward? Think of it as a figure eight with the center, the antenna, being the center of the figure eight, a lobe going down and a lobe going up out of that antenna. When you turn that transmitter on its side, the figure eight is now sideways and you've got signal going to the left and right, not just up and down or not up and down. So now if you put that antenna directly on the utility, you don't want to put service into, signal into. Now you have nulled out or canceled out the utility right underneath that antenna that it's turned on its side now. And you've got that dipole signal going to the left and to the right, coupling into these other utilities. This can be helpful where we've got a, um, a water main locate that I have to do. And the water main is running parallel to a gas main that's about three feet away. When I induce into my water main with my transmitter, that water main may be three or four feet deep and that gas main may be two or three feet deep. The gas main is also a better conductor made out of steel instead of cast iron or ductile iron. So that gas main may pick and carry that signal better. And as I'm up the street doing a locate, my signal brings me right to a gas valve. Now I know my signal is on that gas main, not on the water main that I think I set my transmitter on. So I come back, I take my transmitter, I move it onto the gas main, Let's say that was my water main. I move it onto the gas main and I turn it sideways. Now I put no signal on this gas main and I do get signal onto this water main. So again, caution, multiple utilities in the ground, you are going to throw signal into those utilities, whether you are doing it this way or you've turned it sideways. But this is a way to null out a particular utility in one of these uh, congested corridors. Okay, I'm sorry, I spent a lot of time on that. One of the other benefits of induction is to do a blind search, to use a two-man system. One of us has the transmitter, one the receiver. We get about 50 feet away from one another and we walk in the same direction across the street when the transmitter drives signal into a utility, the receiver picks it up. So this is a two-man blind search. When you do one of these, you want to crisscross. So here we are doing a blind search. We've got a utility here, it looks like. I suspect there's something underground. We're going to walk across that road and into the ground, uh, so, uh, uh, grass here. And when the transmitter drives signal into that utility, the receiver will pick it up. Here's a one-man blind search. I've set my transmitter on the ground here. I've gotten about 40 feet away or so, and I walk across with the receiver to see if I pick up signal. If I don't, take the transmitter, move it three or four feet this way, and then search again with your receiver here to see if you pick up signal. If you do, mark that spot. Take your transmitter, move it to that spot, and with your receiver, stand over here. Walk over here to pick up the signal in the case of a one-man blind search. Another way to use the induction antenna is we are going to do a sweep all the way around with the transmitter while holding in a fixed position with the receiver. And once that transmitter crosses that utility, the receiver may pick it up. Again, keep your distance between transmitter and receiver so that you don't air couple to one another. Now, getting back to the six step process, we talked about conductive, inductive clamp, inductive antenna. 
let's verify that the transmitter is putting out a signal. So today's transmitters give us some sort of um, information that it's putting out a signal. So we have lights, bar graphs, numbers. There are different ways that transmitters will tell us that we're driving 30 milliamps of signal or 100 milliamps of signal. Once you verify that the transmitter is on and putting out a signal, scan the area for all signals. This is a mistake that I often made when doing demonstrations or training. I hook up my transmitter to a utility. I take a few steps away to where I think it should be going and I pick up a signal. Yep, here it is. Follow me guys, here I got a signal right here. If I had completed this circuit, I would have found other structures. Then I can make a determination based on the strength of the signal, which one of these to follow. Then come back and follow the other and the other and the other. So the mistake is I find a signal, I assume it's the only signal and I follow it, mark it and walk away. Do a full circle around your connection point to verify that you found all the structures that may be tied to you and can also verify this one is stronger than that one and take it to a known endpoint, trace it out. So again, our mistake is the first signal we find may not be the one we're looking for. So do that full circle. Keep that receiver plumb. We have a tendency to swing the locator. And that tendency swinging is going to get you in trouble. Now, there's a difference between a lot of swinging and a little swinging. A little swinging never hurt anybody, but a lot of swinging is going to get you in trouble. So keep that in mind. All right. Now, the radio detection equipment the RD-72 and RD-8200 series that was just released here, they have a swing alert feature. And that feature lets you know that you're swinging a little too much and will vibrate and give you a warning tone, meaning let's, let's calm that down a little bit. What's the whole point? Why is that important? Your antennas mounted in the housing of the shaft of your locator, whatever brand you're using. These antennas need to move plumb through the magnetic field that is invisible coming up out of the ground as hopefully a nice round circle. Remember, nice and round when it's clean, distorted makes it oblong, egg-shaped. Clean round magnetic field moving through these antennas or distorted magnetic field moving through these antennas your antennas need to pick them up and keep those antennas plumb when you're ready to put a mark on the ground. Swinging and spraying as you walk can lead to a little bit of inaccuracy. So the swing alert feature will let you know that you're swinging that antenna, <coughs> excuse me, a little too much. All right, now that we've scanned the area for all signals, we're going to pick one and we're going to trace it out. Now your receiver has antennas built in and your receiver has, has ways to tell you this is the high point of the magnetic field. This fissure, what guys call the M-scope, the split box, the TW6, gives you a audio indicator and a, a, a meter here, an analog gauge. Uh, Tech A10, you have a three-digit signal strength number and a left-right guidance system with an audible tone telling you left and right. Here with the RD unit, in this mode, we're in the peak mode, and this mode will give you the highest bar graph, highest numerical signal strength number, and loudest sound when you're over the high point of the magnetic field. This unit also gives you some more information. For this 810, we press a button to see depth on the screen. With this unit, 
Depth is re, uh, shown on the screen automatically when you're over the line and in line with it. And it also shows us the current measurement. On the fissure, we can triangulate for depth by tilting it on a 45 degree angle on its side and moving it away from, at a right angle, moving it away from the signal and picking up a high point again to triangulate for signal for depth. Now, with these units, they have peak and null antennas built into them. Uh, some of them do, some of them have peak only. There are some units out there that still use null only, uh, but peak and null is common in today's locators. Peak antennas are horizontally mounted and they give us the strongest or highest response when we're over the high point of the magnetic field. Loudest sound, highest numbers. Null antennas are vertically mounted and they give us the weakest response when you're over the high point of the magnetic field. Null antennas usually go silent when you're over the high point of the magnetic field and make tone or noise to the right and to the left. They usually also have arrows, visual arrows that show on the screen to move us right and left. So between them, Peak antennas are more accurate than null antennas when there's distortion of the magnetic field. So what do we mean by that? Now in this slide, we see the two peak antennas are horizontally mounted and they give us the high point of the magnetic field. The null response gives us the weakest indication. They are the vertically mounted antennas. And what it amounts to is this. For the most accuracy in locating, paint and peak. So let's break it down this way. Your locator has arrows and the arrows put you right here. Your locator also has a numerical signal strength number and it is also putting you right here, same spot. Peak and null are agreeing with one another. That's a clean round magnetic field. But let's say that my arrows put me here, but my highest number has me here. When this happens, it's telling me that I have distortion of the magnetic field. And with distortion, we are going to be more accurate when there's distortion with the peak antennas. I don't paint where the arrows put me, I paint where the highest number puts me. So we call that painting in peak. Use the peak antennas for more accuracy. All right, depth readings. Depth is taken by usually two peak, an well, always, two peak antennas, lower peak antenna in the housing and an upper peak antenna in the housing, both looking down at the magnetic field. The higher antenna, the upper antenna, gets a weaker signal than the bottom one because it's further away. There's a mathematical calculation that takes the drop of signal from the lower antenna to the upper, and this fixed distance between those two antennas and calculates depth. Now, there's a lot of things that go wrong with depth readings, and that's why it's never trusted. And that's why you locators out there, we don't give depth to the contractors. Protect yourselves from liability that way. Protect your contractors from injury. We don't give depth because depth can have a lot of things that throw it off. So let's talk about a few of those things that throw the depth off. T's, your depth reading too close to where you have two converging signals. You have a distorted magnetic field here. That T is going to be a problem. You have a bend in the pipe. These two pipes running parallel to one another. You can get distortion in this area with these two utilities. Now, this one makes a turn, gets into clearer area, no distortion, the depth will be more accurate. The depth will be more accurate here. It'll be less accurate here, where we have a possible distorted magnetic field. Our pipe makes an elevation change. So right here where our pipe goes from, uh, say, five feet to two feet, this spot where we jump up here, there's going to be distortion in this area. So distortion is going to create a problem. Earlier, I talked about induction, and one of the issues is you air couple. You have to be far enough away. You have to be even further away for your depth to have more dependability. 
I don't like to use the word accuracy when it comes to depth because we should never trust or put faith in the depth number from the locator. For those of you with a lot of experience, you've seen your locator be dead on and you've seen it be way off. There's a lot of things that affect depth that we can't see that are going on underground. And so that's why the depth reading is um, not considered uh, accurate. Hey, you awake out there? You guys still awake? Everybody? All right, still with me? Okay. Depth is a tool that we often use to get a sense of whether we're on the right structure or not. If I'm chasing a water main and I'm seeing eight inch depths, there's a question in my head about am I on a water main or not? So another tool in the toolbox for many locators is reading current measurement. So current measurement is how much current is being carried by the conductor. Usually the conductor you are attached to with your direct connect leads is going to carry more current than the other conductors that your signal may be bleeding or coupling onto. So as an example, I get a really strong signal here and I've got 13 milliamps. This signal is weaker, but I've got 27 milliamps. This signal is weaker yet with a lot less milliamps. The higher milliamp here is what I'm connected to, even though the signal strength is not as high as it is with this one. My milliamp output is stronger. So why would my signal strength be stronger on this one? This utility may be much shallower. Here's that eight inch deep cable TV wire. And this is my um, 24, 30 inch deep tracing wire on my gas service. So this is why current measurement can be a valuable tool for us to make that determination. Current measurement also will dissipate as I go further down my conductor. So it's normal for the current to be weakening as I get further and further away from my connection point or my transmitter. Now, here's a feature that's unique to an RD8200. It's called current direction. Current direction shows an arrow on the screen the direction the current is flowing. Now, radio detection achieves this by putting two frequencies on the line simultaneously. One is twice the sine wave of the other in frequency, twice the frequency. So there's some sort of um, uh, engineering marvel that occurs in there that allows the receiver to tell the current direction. Now, with regular locating, we don't know a current direction because current is alternating current, AC. It's moving back and forth. But by using this technology, we can tell the flow or direction of the current of these two frequencies overlapped on each other. So in this slide, there's an arrow that appears on the screen, and this arrow is pointing away from my transmitter. These arrows are pointing back. That is, my signal is also getting on these other utilities and on this guardrail. But as I bring my locator over them, the arrow points back to my transmitter. The arrow points away from my transmitter. This is me, this is what I'm connected to, and this is bleed off signal onto other utilities or structures. So current direction is real helpful for us in areas where we have our signal coupling bleeding onto other utilities, which put question marks in our heads as to which one we are painting our color, which one is ours. So those are features of the receiver that can help us in determining which is our conductor. Now, another tool in our toolbox that we can control is the frequency that we put out. So we've broken the frequencies down into three ranges here, low, medium, and high. So low frequencies are considered less than one kilohertz. Medium frequencies run from the one to 50 kilohertz range and high frequencies are considered higher than 50 kilohertz. So uh, on a uh, RD transmitter, we have a 512 hertz feature that would be considered low. A33 kilohertz are considered medium frequencies and 65, 83, 131, 200 are considered high frequencies. Higher frequencies bleed off more. They jump more. 
Lower frequencies want to stay on the path you put them on, less likely to jump off onto other utilities and will travel further. Higher frequencies induce well, but they bleed off onto other things much faster, much easier. So when we try to isolate signals, when I do a direct connect and I want to isolate signals, I try to use the lowest frequency I can drive onto that utility. So the general rule of thumb is start with your lower frequencies. And if you're not getting a good signal, move up. All right. That, in essence, is uh, frequencies. I always considered them uh, the fairy tale, the tortoise and the hare. The turtle races the rabbit. Low frequencies are turtles, high frequencies are rabbits. The turtle stays on the path, doesn't get distracted, doesn't take a break, just keeps plodding along. The rabbit takes off like a shot, gets tired, gets distracted easily. Low frequencies are turtles, high frequencies are rabbits. Now, trace your signal, getting back to the six step process to a known endpoint. Where does it take you? If I've connected to the site light wiring, I better be taking, uh, my signal better be taking me to that next pole, to that next site light wire pole. So where does it take me? If I've connected to this cable TV um, uh, sheath wire, it better lead me to the cable box here and not to the electric transformer. So these are things that we do in the field to verify. Does it take you where it's supposed to take you? So as part of the six step process to finish up that locate, where does it take you? Okay, you're in the field and you're struggling. There's something called three changes and a move. What can we do when we're struggling out in the field? Remember this, think of your transmitter as the radio station and think of your receiver as your car radio, okay? Now, if you're driving down the highway with your favorite radio station on and you're getting a bad signal, that is you've driven too far away, do you bang the dashboard of your car to get the signal in better? No, don't blame your car radio. You know what's happened. You've driven out of the range of the wattage of your radio tower. Your transmitter's your radio tower. When you're getting a bad signal with your receiver, it's not your receiver's fault. It's the transmitter's fault. So when you're getting a bad signal, go back to your transmitter, three changes and a move. Change where and what you're grounded to. Change your frequency and your power output. Change how you're putting a signal on it. I've been directly connected, let me try the clamp. I've been using the clamp, let me try the induction antenna. Change your method, change your frequency and your power output, change where and what you're grounded to, and if those changes don't give you a better signal in your car radio at your receiver, move. So I've been at this valve north, go to that valve and come south. Come at it from a different direction. Have you heard the saying, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? If you don't make changes at your transmitter, you're going to keep getting the same results with your receiver. So go back to that transmitter and make your changes there. Three changes, and if they fail, move. Now, we've been talking about pipe and cable locators. Also, uh, we are going to be doing Zoom meetings on metal detectors and um, uh, GPR, so I'm not going to spend any time on them. But <clears throat> in the metal detecting world, there are two basic types, the stick type and the dish type. Stick types are usually ferrous metal detectors and the dish type are usually all metal detectors. They operate differently. So tune into the Zoom meeting to learn a little bit more about how they operate and which one may be better suited for you. Now let's talk about locating plastic. So with plastic locating, we can put a sound wave into that water stream we can put a deductible rod or sond into that um, sewer pipe or duct. We can use ground penetrating radar to locate uh, these non-metallic lines. So there are different technologies out there to help us find 
plastic, terracotta, uh, AC pipe, and so forth. Pressure wave technology using a transond and then listening from above ground for the signal. We can induce or put signal into that uh, plastic pipe or concrete pipe using a locatable duct rod. And here we are pushing a locatable duct rod into a pipe through a, uh, through a, a T or a junction. We can attach sons that are built into the heads of sewer cameras and directional boring equipment. We can attach a portable sond onto that pipe or cable. So these sons can come pretty small and you can push them into that uh, duct using a fish tape, a sewer snake, or a locatable duct rod. Sons, of course, uh, can be located from above ground with most receivers tuned to the correct frequency. And uh, finally, ground penetrating radar to locate these non-metallic utilities. Uh, ground penetrating radar is expensive, a little bit more than these other items. And uh, they uh, are susceptible to some issues of soil types, <clears throat> excuse me. So high clay content in soil uh, has a high electrical conductivity and that high electrical conductivity seems to block or interfere with radar signals. In this slide, uh, we have uh, very good information seen on the screen, what we call good radar data, good GPR data. Nice clean hyperbolas uh, showing information here. And here, no information. So this is a very uh, bad soil condition, in this case, uh, dense clay. There are GPR suitability maps out there available through the uh, uh, Geological Survey. The US Geological Survey, uh, look them up and look for GPR, GPR suitability maps. And they are from uh, all different, all the uh, 50 states. Uh, you can get the information here. It's color coded and get a sense of uh, purple. You're gonna get very bad GPR data right in here. And the darkest green, you're gonna get really good radar data right there. And here, purple, very poor radar data right in here, very poor along the coast. Salt water is the issue, it's brackish water. Dark green, good information here. So with uh, GPR technology, uh, there's a place, there's, it's a tool in the toolbox. It is not the only tool that you can use out there to help us locate. Once you do locate that plastic out there, let's put something in the ground that we can now locate in the future. So we use marker technology, marker pegs, marker balls that we put into the ground. And now we can find these 20, 40 years from now and find that exact spot where that ball is buried and get a depth or location on that ball or that marker stake. So there is technology out there to help us find the plastics and non-metallic lines. And there's technology that we can put into the ground on top of that to find that exact spot years and years from now. All right. Now, I uh, zoomed through that pretty quickly. And I'd like to thank you for your, uh, for your interest. And um, uh, we have uh, time for some questions here. So Jim's coming back on to assist. I am. Yes. If anybody has any questions, they can either type them in the chat uh, or they can raise their hand um, through that option there at the bottom of the um, at the chat or it's either in there or your reactions at the bottom of your screen um, for that. Jimmy, I just think you're that good. <laughs> No, if I go back to that slide of my sleeping student, I think yeah. that's what happened. No, no, no. Um, <clears throat> uh, we do have a question, actually, uh, from Doc. Uh, locating tracer wire that is damaged or cannot hook up to. Yes. So um, you have no, no contact point. Um, so let, let's start with it's damaged. That is, I do have a connection point uh, along its path. Uh, it's damaged. The only thing that you could try to do to see that if that signal can jump and couple into the non-damaged or the uh, 
Uh, I've got a break between the wires. Somebody put a shovel through it. If the ends are that close together and the soil is that moist, by using a high frequency at full power, I might be able to jump, jump some signal through there. The disadvantage is that you're going to jump signal into a lot of different things using full power and a high frequency. Now, let's go back to, uh, I don't have any connection on the other side, so I can't get back to this point. In that application, it's tough. You can try to put a signal on the tracer wire, say on the, on the gas main, and see if you can get some of it to run in that direction. You can move your ground spike in the direction that you want your signal to go to. So as an example, I've connected to a uh, tracer wire at a riser. I want it to go to the main and turn right. Move your ground spike in that direction where you want it to go and see if you can entice it to turn to the right. This isn't helping us in the case of a broken wire or a wire that we can't find the end to, uh, but it can help us in situations where our signal is going in a wrong direction than where we need to locate. In the case of the break, we can try inducing into that wire and to induce into tracer wire where you don't have a connection point, you wanna use a high frequency and full power. So you wanna get up into the higher frequency ranges, 65 and above and crank your power up to try to induce into it. You can also find the break, dig it up there and we can find the break by looking to where the signal is dying uh, or using an A-frame to do a fault locate to tell us exactly where that break is. So there is technology to help us find where that end of that wire is. Hopefully the other end of the wire is right there where we could then, then do a repair or at least connect to and continue the locate. Jim, can I be so bold to share something there? Yeah, please, yes. Um, I've recently had a, a situation where I, I got a call from a technician in the field uh, who was uh, trying to locate a, a broken tracer wire, but he didn't know it was a broken tracer wire. He called me because his transmitter indicated that he had zero milliamp output when he was connected to the tracer wire. So when he called, I was pretty convinced that he had a defective set of leads, but he uh -huh. he tested his leads and they were good. So I asked that technician to connect to another utility on the side of the house. And of course the transmitter indicated output. So what we were able to determine was the tracer wire was indeed broken. Rather than that technician trying to force a bad signal um, and not knowing that his tracer wire was broken and perhaps having signal bleed onto another utility, he was at least aware that the tracer wire was broken and there was no way for him to effectively mm -hmm. locate that. Just a yeah, thought. Getting, getting, getting no signal on it. Yeah. Right, exactly. So sometimes just knowing what you're up against is part of the process. Very good. Anyone else have any thoughts on broken tracer wire? I'm sure there's some real experienced uh, uh, locators out there who may have uh, found uh, some ways or did some things that uh, helped them. I uh, got one here um, from Mr. Fowler uh, for 360 circulation induction sweeps. What is the difference in having the transmitter at the center versus the receiver at the center? Uh, you could do either or. If you put the transmitter at the center, what I would do is I would put it, uh, say, facing north-south, do a sweep, and then go back to the transmitter and turn it east-west uh, so that I've got the greatest chance of putting signal on a structure that may be nearby. If I just keep that transmitter in one direction and the utility is running it opposite from where my antenna is crossing it, I'm not going to put a signal onto it. So you do want to move that transmitter both ways. Um, the, I, I would say that um, one way is not better than the other. It's just two ways to do it.
Okay. Uh, any other questions? Oh, a big question. All right. From Tiffany. <laughs> I'm new to this just a few months in. What would you do if you can't make a circuit at all? Uh, for example, I connect to a tracer wire and grounding stake and can't get any signal. This happens just this morning. Uh, I moved uh, the ground stake, tried water, and still couldn't get a tone at all. No other interrupting utilities crossed that it was aware of and tried from another service could only pick up the main. Uh, you were able to pick up the main. That That's interesting. Or maybe you were... You were able to locate the main, but when you went to the service, you weren't able to locate it. Well, it sounds like what Larry had just described to us uh, might be a situation there. Your tracer wire can be broken right there at the riser. Um, if you're in the field and it does that again, grab the end of that tracer wire and pull and see, see if you end up uh, falling backwards on your butt because you just yanked that broken tracer wire out of the ground. Um, so that could be that application right there in that we have a break in that tracer wire. In the locate world, tracer wire is usually fairly straightforward in, in tracing. Um, the drawback is if the tracer wire is not going to ground at the far end, then your signal runs a chance of bleeding or uh, jumping into other utilities that your signal sees as a better path to earth. From what you're describing, it sounds like what exactly Larry was describing. And that is we have a, a break in that tracer wire right there at the riser where it's wrapped. So very close, uh, very close to you and no signal going out. Uh, and uh, I will note too, uh, Tiffany, I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about a gas service. Um, you know, Jameson, the rotter, there are rotter systems uh, that do have stuffing boxes for gas services so that you can essentially install a tracer wire at that point when you have those broken tracer wires or if a tracer wire was never present on that service to begin with for whatever reason. Um, they do make stuffing boxes for that as well. Uh, so it essentially rotter systems that can do that into live gas. Um, in that particular case, you talk to your utility company, or if you're with the utility company, work with the gas service there. So. Okay, any other questions? All right, I didn't see anything else come across. Remember folks, we're always here for you. Um, if you ever have any questions or you know have any needs for underground utility solutions uh please get a hold of us um at eastcom we handle the northeast um you have jimmy's information up there and if um, you're not in his territory uh he'll direct you in the right way um but if uh, anybody else has any other questions uh just email us uh, jverga at eastcomassos.com uh and again we want to thank you for taking time out of your day uh, to join us. Oh, we got to do another question here from Tony. Uh, directional drillers sometimes break the tracer wire during the uh, pullback, causing an illusion that the tracer wire is intact at both points. Um, ah, good point. Um, yes. Directional drilling is is does create challenges in a lot of avenues, uh, so it is very very possible. Um, yeah, especially when they're directional drilling for whatever lines, right? Um, okay. Well. Uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. Everyone have a good weekend. Uh, and keep in mind, we have other classes coming up next week. Be on the lookout from training at eastcomassos.com for our other classes coming up. Next week, we're going to be doing non-metallic lines. We're going to be getting involved in the depth in depth in there. Uh, and then moving forward beyond that, we're going to be doing metal detectors and also GPR. Uh, so, and other classes as well coming up in the next month or so. So uh, be on the lookout. And if you have any questions, just we're always here. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Jimmy, you want to stay on for a minute? Yeah, sure. Larry, if you want to do. Oh, look at that Mark Norris guy. Yeah, he nice popped up on my screen. Yeah, nice He's of you to here. join us, Mark. I know he's driving. Uh, hi, Aaron. Oh, is he Aaron? Hey, hey, Aaron. Hey, how you doing? 
Mark, you can well. have a nice Can you guys morning. hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm on my way up to meet Jason with the airbag. So uh, I was listening in. I had to finish up a business call and then jumped on to uh, listen, man. Excellent. Uh, excellent teaching. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, look, you have a good one. Enjoy the weekend, and uh, we'll talk to everybody soon. Drive Thanks, soon. Mark. Same to you. Hey, Mark, where are you meeting Jason? So I, I can I can fill that in. Jason wanted to meet Mark in suburban uh, Washington at around huh. three thirty this afternoon. And I three thirty? Oh, yeah. really? I said no, 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 Jason. You're not going to do that. <laughs> you're not going to do that meet him even with east covid even meet, with covid you don't want meet to meet him on the eastern shore and have lunch together wow um uh jimmer you know you and i texted back and forth a little um during the session yeah we, we need to go over the uh, the new uh, PowerPoint or the, the revised PowerPoint with everybody? Yeah, I've got an email coming. I was just uh, typing right now. I'm going to send out a couple of dates uh, so we can do a, a team Zoom meeting. Uh, for Wasn't that. I using the most current? Uh, no, I, I no, modified no, we're, this. We're talking about the big one. Yeah, and Jimmy, what, what you did is fine. You know, I mean, uh, when, when you're doing those sessions or the session like you did, um, you know, it, it has to be whatever you want to speak to. But um, in the in the coming sessions where we're breaking it up into the mod modules. Yeah, we, we, we need to be pretty clear on on what's going to get covered in module yeah. one, module two and module three. And I right. think the, the new presentation kind of does that better. Right. And we'll, and we'll do adjustments a little bit for module one, you know, clean up the PowerPoint to break it into three modules. And We'll go from there. So, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'll throw out some. Hey, guys, how are you? Hi, Steve. Hey. Hi, Grant. Steve, Grant. Grant. Good to see you. What would you think? That was great. Like, very informative. We really liked it. Thank you. Look at hey. all the foreheads. Look, look, look at all the. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. This yeah. is here. Grant, you know, Steve. Yeah. 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 Hey, I resemble. You resemble that hey, remark. Jimmy. Yeah, I was hanging up. up when I heard someone say Mark, and uh, did you say something as I was hanging up? Yeah, when you got on, your audio was still on, so we could hear you driving. <laughs> it was only oh, on for about, I'm sorry. It was only like 10 or 15 seconds. It wasn't long, though. But um, I, I even oh. said, hey, Mark, you need to, you need to mute. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it, it, I, I think I had joined through uh, the internet versus a direct call in and it, everything was going screwy. So I just cut the phone off and restarted and was able to get it straight then. Yeah. So that must have been what happened. I'll tell you All what, right. guys. Well, good uh, thanks, Mark. Mark, drive safe. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not very right, thanks, comfortable. Buddy. See you, Mark. I'm not real comfortable doing these Zoom things because I'm used to standing in front of a group of people. Yeah. And I've got all the equipment in front of me where I can do visual stuff and, and I could hold things and, and I could, I could wave my, my ground spike at people. And, and um, it, it just uh, doing this is not, uh, not very comfortable for me. Yeah. For, for none of us, Jimmy, but you know what, I think you, you did a really good job. Yeah. Um, I had, uh, for the most part, I just had, I didn't have your uh, icon visible. So we weren't watching you at all. Oh, okay. We just uh, had your uh, your uh, um, uh, monitor displayed. You know, could you see my cursor? Yes. yes. Okay, good. At least you could see that. Yep. Yeah. And then at one point, I heard you moving stuff around, and I thought, you know what? I bet he's holding stuff up and and trying to do visuals. So then then I turned your your thumbnail on, and we could see you. Well, I was able to see on, on my screen the thumb, my thumbnail, and I could see um, three blank thumbnails under it. That is, they were black thumbnails with your name. 
So it had Larry's and Mark's and there was someone else in there who I, I didn't know. Their faces weren't visible, but just a black thumbnail box. And that's why I asked Jimmer, I was saying when we started about, um, hey, could you uh, take your, uh, your uh, video off? And you were saying you didn't see them, but uh, they were visual, uh, visible on mine. Yeah. So up on your, the right-hand corner of uh, Zoom, you'll find there's uh, something called uh, view. Yeah. If you click on view, you can adjust what you see on, on the display. There we go, speaker view. Yeah. Yeah, by the time I got got rolling, yep. uh, I was already I was already past uh, monkeying around. I should have monkeyed around first. <laughs>